Thank you all for inviting me uh, to come and talk about pediatric catatonia. Um, I'm not able to see anybody who's in the room. I may know some of you. Uh, my name is Cassie Carlson. I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist and neuropsychiatrist. And until last year, I was on faculty at Indiana University um, and actually also spent some time at the NDI. I was one of the psychiatrists on the autism unit. Um, my specialty <laughs> is treating children and uh, adults with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So, uh, and then Dr. Melissa Butler is a good friend and um, I think was asked me if I would come talk about pediatric catatonia today. She and I have taken care of many patients together with pediatric catatonia. So um, I don't know that I'm able to, to um, see if anybody has any questions, but feel free uh, to unmute and ask anything uh, during it. And hopefully I have some time for, for questions at the end. So um, catatonia is something that definitely uh, has taken on kind of its own meaning in just the lay uh, population and in our, you know, figures of speech um, here with Raj and Sheldon, right? Um, uh, and a lot of times we think of something uh, where you become very stiff or overcome with fear. Um, and so kind of conjure up in your brain when you hear the word catatonia or catatonic, kind of what you're thinking. A lot of us think of the, the terms, you know, scared stiff or playing possum. Um, and, and interestingly, there are some similarities uh, from a kind of a, a neurologic uh, perspective of, of what's going on sometimes in, in some animals that uh, do have this reflex, which is kind of the opposite of fight or flight, um, and kind of what we've known as scared stiff. Um, playing possum kind of in our, I think, our modern uh, terminology is, is often considered faking, <laughs> right? If you're not really asleep, you're faking. But we know now that, that possums actually, this is, this is a reflex and it's built in um, to survival and they're not actually just faking it. Um, and, and so again, this is a lot of times what we're thinking of when we're thinking um, catatonia. Or maybe you know a little bit about catatonia. You've been working in state psychiatric hospitals for a long time. You've seen some of these classic images online um, where people are stuck kind of in certain positions. They don't move for hours or days. Um, and so maybe this is what you're thinking in your mind um, when you're thinking of catatonia. And, and really, this is why pediatric catatonia has sometimes feels so elusive, is because it's really none of these things and all of these things um, at the same time and really variable and really our understanding and our growing understanding of, of kind of modern catatonia is it, it certainly... Um, in its history, uh, you know, some of the reasons that we thought you might become catatonic, maybe from trauma or fear, may play a role, but we're developing a much better understanding of kind of the neurobiology and certainly the tr behind it than we, we used to have. Um, so I wanted to start with some cases because these are all, I, I want you to be thinking of these kids. Um, throughout my talk today. Um, I will say that this is a lot. This topic is a lot for like a 30 to 40 minute lunch and learn presentation, leaving some time for questions. And so really my goals today when Justin reached out to me is, you know, I want um, you guys to feel like you're a little bit more familiar with what it looks like in kids and what you should be looking for and then what you should be thinking about about next steps. Um, certainly, if you feel like you have a patient who may have catatonia, or you'd like to learn more about the treatment of catatonia, or maybe you're a catatonia expert, but you just haven't taken care of a lot of kids, um, certainly would love to chat with you further. And I have some recommended readings at the end. But again, I just want to introduce the idea that sometimes catatonia is, is presenting in these kids that we see that we wouldn't normally think about. So again, I'm going to briefly talk about these, and then at the end, we're going to come back to the cases and talk a little more about them, but I want you to have them in your mind while we're going forward here. 
So case one, the 13 year old girl came to our emergency department. She had about a week history of just seeming a little more confused. She stopped sleeping. She was having decreased speech. She was having some slow, but also repetitive movements. So she wasn't just stuck, um, but decreased eating and drinking. Um, she did have a history of anxiety and there are also a lot of kind of recent family stressors um, that she was dealing with. Uh, case number two, a 16 year old male. He was a very good student. He was a great athlete. He presented with about a two-week history onset of decreased speech, insomnia, slowed movements, not eating or drinking. This was a significant change from his baseline. He did have a history of mild anxiety, and family had been concerned about recent depressive symptoms and some decline in school performance. He also had recently started a new school year and had some ongoing family stressors with some with his divorced parents. Um, Case three, this is a 17-year-old with a history of intellectual disability. Her school had actually been concerned for several months that she was uh, more withdrawn, she was anxious, she wasn't completing her schoolwork, had decreased speech. Uh, they'd encouraged the parent to seek mental health evaluation. Um, then she developed insomnia, she wasn't eating and drinking as well, and she was staying in bed all the time. She was taken to the emergency department, but she perked up a little bit with fluids, and so she was sent home with recommended outpatient psych eval. And then a couple more. Um, again, there's some variability here, so I want you to have them all in your mind. Um, case four, a 15-year-old girl, adopted, academically and musically gifted, developed paranoia, auditory hallucinations, insomnia, confusion, and agitation over several weeks. Um, she had some repetitive speech and movements, some pacing. Um, sometimes her walking was, was slowed intermittently, which was unusual because she was very athletic. Um, she was admitted to an inpatient psychiatric unit and started on risperidone, and her symptoms got significantly worse since she stopped talking. Um, and then our last one to think about is a 16-year-old male with autism, intellectual disability, seizure disorder, migraine, so very complex. Um, had a history of severe problem behaviors, head banging, physical aggression, um, and had had multiple medication trials with limited benefit, but a recent retrial of risperidone. He was brought to the emergency department due to six plus months of no improvement, decreased interaction, decreased intake, um, and now he was having insomnia. He was refusing to open his eyes, and he was holding the saliva in his mouth and was struggling with incontinence, even though he'd previously been confident. So what the heck am I describing, right? What is, what is pediatric catatonia? Um, and so catatonia was first reported in a child in the early 1900s. This is about 30 years after famous psychiatrist Carl Kaelbaum initially described catatonia in an adult psychiatric inpatient. The initial pediatric descriptions um, when you read them are also likely consistent what what we would diagnose with with autism spectrum disorders and so i think um, on one hand um there was a really early recognition of maybe some similarities but but what happened in kind of the world of psychiatric research and in um in catatonia was that a couple of, of researchers that were and well psychiatrists that um focused on schizophrenia really kind of took over um, much of the catatonia research and that, and it, and it kind of got, got stuck in, in schizophrenia for, for decades. And so a lot of times um, and when we learned about, you know, catatonia or we saw a patient with catatonia, in our mind we were thinking schizophrenia, maybe major depressive disorder, but but that was partially that, like I said, it kind of got stuck in that world in terms of who was looking into it and really um, didn't kind of continue to be researched and considered um, in other populations, especially medical illnesses, which we're going to talk a lot more about. So pediatric catatonia was initially thought to be rare. I will be honest, even when I was in training, which um, wasn't all too long ago, although it's getting longer and longer and <laughs> getting closer to 20 years than I was before, but um, 
but you know, we didn't, I didn't think I saw a lot of catatonia. At least that wasn't what I was taught. And, and the ones that I did see were much more of that classic presentation of those pictures that I showed you earlier. Right. Um, and, and, but not that I was seeing regularly or at a, a, a you know, increased basis, but you know, there's been some studies that show that we really may, may be missing a lot of cases, not only of pediatric um, cases, but also of adult psychiatric <clears throat> inpatient. So you can see some studies finding even 17% of a pediatric inpatient population and up to 38% one study um, in adult psychiatric inpatients. Obviously, those are really variable numbers, and you and I all know that um, inpatient psychiatric units can look very, very different from each other. Um, but obviously a lot more prevalent than it is rare. And, and my guess is, you know, if you follow kind of the medical literature on this, um, you've seen certainly a lot of increased um, talk about catatonia research, case reports, and a lot of that has to do with really, I think, the increased recognition. And then I, I know certainly I can think back to patients that I treated earlier in my career that I think I probably missed catatonia. Um, so it's associated with many psychiatric and medical conditions, and actually up to 20% of cases in pediatric patients are estimated to be related to an underlying medical condition. Everybody thinks that's probably an, an underestimate. And I think this is the really important thing, too, is that catatonia can be lethal. Um, and I just talked about five kids who all had a pretty significant change in their baseline. They're not eating. They're not drinking. Several of them are agitated. And this can really progress without treatment and, like I said, can, can be lethal. So it's very important that it's recognized and treated. It is seen in higher rates um, in um, pediatric patients with neurodevelopmental disorders and other genetic syndromes for reasons that we will touch about on in just a bit. So the definition of catatonia that um, we use in the DSM-5 is a marked psychomotor disturbance that can involve decrease decreased motor activity, decreased engagement during interview or physical examination, or excessive or peculiar motor activity. So you got to love a definition that says it can be decreased or it can be excessive, right? You're like, that really narrows it down. But that's really true. And this is, I think, where sometimes our initial thought about catatonia of just being stuck and not moving, not doing anything, really limits our diagnostic ability because there often is some shifting back and forth. And sometimes it's actually excessive motor activity um, that we're seeing. But really thinking about it is that change in the motor and in behaviors that we're looking for. So the symptoms, um, and, and don't don't get worried when you look at these and say, what the heck is this? Because we're going to go through these symptoms and, and talk about them more. Um, but these are the 12 symptoms that we look for in catatonia. Um, and as you know, as the DSM is set up, we have catatonia, which can be associated with another mental disorder. Um, and you need three of 12 symptoms plus an associated psychiatric disorder in order to meet criteria. It can be related to a medical condition, again, three of the 12. Um, and then uh, unspecified catatonia. And, and I will say that there are a fair amount of patients that fall into that category where we can't always identify an underlying um, psychiatric or medical Medical condition, especially individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders who seem to be at higher risk for developing catatonia. So the differential diagnosis of pediatric catatonia is really broad, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through this because, again, this could be a lecture series in itself talking about each one. But I want you just to see how very broad it can be. And, and these themselves are not exhaustive lists. These are just some examples um, of case reports uh, where, you know, catatonia has been documented in pediatric cases. So we have infectious and autoimmune illnesses like anti-NMDA encephalitis, mononucleosis, lupus, um, other viral encephalitis, uh, pandas, many of you have heard of that. Um, there are several degenerative disorders that we don't often think of in kids. Huntington's is one of them. There are a few others. 
um, that sometimes we see increased risk, uh, congenital metabolic disorders, um, Wilson's disease, um, some other metabolic syndromes, some different like tumors or uh, neurosurgical conditions, prescription medications, uh, drugs, um, especially some of the ones that I've listed there, synthetics is a big one, and then psychiatric. Um, and then I somehow got caught off of the slide, but, but neurodevelopmental disorders, so including autism, intellectual disability, and Down syndrome, um, as well as Fragile X, and there are several others where there are documented cases, so um, multiple neurodevelopmental disorders. So I think it's hard to wrap your head around often, and I even sometimes do. I mean, this is one of the things that I specialize in, and sometimes I just find myself sitting and thinking, like, so you're telling me that we can have all these psychiatric etiologies and all these medical etiologies that are all very different, and they can all cause catatonia symptoms, right? Um, and then what we know is that you can see a similar response when we treat catatonia, whether it's psychiatric or medical, again, right, really kind of mind blown there. And so what does that lead us to think, right? I mean, how could this be that we're saying all of these different things can cause the syndrome of catatonia? Well, based on a kind of our current understanding is that all of these things, all of these illnesses, all of these stressors, um, are likely can result in a common neural pathway that is a response to a variety of stressors, right? Whether they are medical, whether they are psychiatric, um, trauma also on that previous list. Um, and so they cause a, you know, a path, a neural pathway and changes in neural pathways that relate, that end up presenting as, as the catatonia syndrome. And the way that I like to think about it is really, we all learned about phenotypes, right? And a phenotype is really a description, right? And catatonia is really like a phenotype in many ways, that it is describing these behaviors, these motor changes, um, but what causes that and what all results in that, um, that there's some common things, but they can all have very different baseline etiologies. So some of that and what it is thought of is that there are some neurochemical theories here, right? Um, and that actually there is an impairment in the excitatory and inhibitory ratios of these neurotransmitters in our brain. So actually, even though catatonia is often associated with slowing and almost seem like shutting down, it's actually glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter in our brain that is often in excess. Right. So it's almost like um, it's rapid firing in our brain. And often when I'm talking to families uh, about it, I say catatonia is not a hardware problem. Right. All the parts are there. Catatonia is a software problem. Right. Where the <clears throat> messages are not getting through correctly. So it's like we've got all this excitatory activity in our brain um, that the messages are not getting through, the transmission is not happening. And actually, we're at, at a deficit of GABA. And GABA is the brakes, right? Which is saying, whoa, slow down. And don't we know that a deficit of GABA neurotransmission is often related to catatonia. Um, and that's going to be important when we talk about some of the different treatments, because really why I'm talking about these neurotransmitters is because we, when we think about what causes catatonia and how do we treat catatonia, we really have to think about this. So for example, if in the brain we have too much glutamate and not enough GABA, right, our treatments are going to be looking at increasing GABA and decreasing the glutamate um, as some options. We also know that dopamine and serotonin can play a role in catatonia. And as an example, um, we know that medications uh, with dopamine blockade just so antipsychotics often worsen catatonic symptoms. So again, kind of a rudimentary overview and understanding, um, and it, it, it does get a little bit more than this, but, but honestly, um, we're still very limited in, in our understanding of, of what exactly causes catatonia. However, when I talked about those shared neural pathways, a lot of these different disorders or individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders that have higher rates of um, catatonia 
are also thought to have underlying abnormalities in like glutamate and, and GABA neurotransmission. So there seems to be some individuals that are predisposed based on genetic issues or the illness itself. Oh, this is my, my fancy slide that I made showing too much glutamate, not enough GABA. That took me um, an embarrassing long time to make. So um, I think one of the things that you may hear about when you talk about catatonia is the Bush Francis catatonia rating scale. It is really kind of the gold standard that we use. If you read any papers about catatonia, um, it's going to reference the Bush Francis catatonia rating scale. And doctors Bush and Francis, still practicing psychiatrists, um, came up with this as a way of like, how can we track these symptoms and give it some sort of an objective measure so that we can follow? So it was a 23 item scale. Um, again, there's kind of you're looking for a presence or absence of symptoms and then also rating severity. Now, like any good screening tool or scale, this in itself is not diagnostic, right? Um, we still have to use our clinical skills, but um, this is really helpful often for following the treatment or how they're doing in severity, um, just because there are a lot of subtleties to the diagnosis. So I think sometimes those of you who take care of kids or take care of individuals with developmental disorders, I mean, there's sometimes there's, there's questions on, um, you know, in the Bush Francis scale where you get a high score of mutism. And I'm thinking like my patient doesn't talk at baseline, right? They're nonverbal. And so it's an imperfect tool. Uh, um, as most tools are to use across the population in which we see catatonia. And I think some things to consider when you're using the scale, especially in these populations is one, can the patient understand the instructions, right? Especially if like an intellectual disability is present. So I think about that a lot in my patients with Down syndrome and autism. Um, and, and also which items on the Bush Francis um, really get at what we're looking for. And we have the screening questions, right, that we follow on the rating scale that says, you know, present, somewhat present, you know, not present. But but really, we need to focus on our interview. Um, and that I'm going to spend some time going through that for you guys to get that bulk of information when the Bush Francis um, fails us. There is a pediatric catatonia rating scale. There are a few, actually. Um, it's less commonly known and used. And so I think because when people write things up, they wanna use what's commonly used in the literature, it's often still the Bush Francis. Um, but there's some similarities, but there's also some differences. Um, one thing that is in the pediatric catatonia reading scale that doesn't show up in the Bush Francis is incontinence. And I will see, we see that more in the pediatric population as well as in adults with neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and like I said, the main thing is just whatever scale you use, pick one and, and use it to kind of monitor how your patient is doing and changing um, as you treat them. So I want to go through a little bit through the exam and the interview because I think it's one thing to open up the page to the DSM to see these symptoms, but then to, how do I elicit, elicit that on exam? And what questions do I ask to really get at, um, is this catatonia or not? So the first one is excitement. Um, and it's important that we're not attributing this to other side effects like achesia or some goal-directed agitation, but asking patients, you know, have you noticed periods, or their families usually is what you're asking, right? Have you noticed periods of them rushing around or agitation without an obvious trigger? Um, do you see constant moving, um, pacing, uh, Im immobility and stupor? Um, so asking families, have you noticed increased slowness? Asking some specifics that sometimes they, they hadn't thought about until you mentioned it. How long is it taking them to eat breakfast now? I've had so many families not report that initially, but when I ask, they're like, oh, yeah. It's taking forever, right? Or how long is it taking to get dressed? Or how long is it taking them to brush their teeth? And, and getting those um, kind of different numbers from them uh, as well. Sometimes you can see, oh, yeah, it used to take 20 minutes. And now it's taking three hours sometimes. So that's a huge change in baseline. Um, mutism. And again, we sometimes are seeing patients that maybe have very limited verbal ability at baseline. So again, has there been a significant reduction in speech or communication from their baseline and really understanding what their baseline is? 
The awesome thing is that everybody carries around a video camera in their pocket right now, right? And so oftentimes, I mean, I don't know that I've met a family in the last five years that didn't have a video of their child somewhere on their phone. And they usually have videos of good times. And oftentimes, if they've been seeing some concerning behaviors, they have videos of those concerns as well, right? So really looking at those videos can be so helpful to see, oh, wow. They were doing this. I mean, and, and that's a hard thing to sometimes capture on baseline. Uh, what was their baseline? But when I see a video of a kid that a year ago was playing his guitar and singing and now is like barely interacting, you know, even if a child has an intellectual disability, I know, oh my gosh, that is a huge change. And again, that's sometimes hard to capture just on the interview. Um, is there staring um, for extended periods of time? A lot of times these kids are getting seen and with these staring and this limited interaction, and what's that triggering, right? People are concerned for seizures. So sometimes these kids are not showing up to psychiatry first. They're showing up to neurology, um, they're having EEGs, those kind of things um, when we see some of these changes in motor behavior and we see um, you know, this abnormal staring. Um, posturing. So this is exactly what kind of those classic pictures of catatonia show, but it's um, uh, saying, you know, do we ever get stuck in one position? If so, for how long? So, you know, I will sometimes have families say, yeah, they just kind of stood in the middle of the kitchen for two hours or um, they were laying on their bed, but in this very odd position or, yeah, they just stand up and hold their arms straight up. Um, so, you know, asking specifics about that and sometimes showing and giving examples helps families kind of, oh, yeah, they are doing that. Um, grimacing, uh, asking about unusual facial expressions. This is often something you're picking up on exam, right? But really a pained grimacing look frequently um, throughout the exam. And again, something that families are not reporting until you ask about it. Um, echopraxia and echolalia. So on exam, some of the things that I'm doing, and, and I just realized I'm, I'm moving my hands and doing stuff, but I don't think you guys can, can see my picture for some reason, only my screen. Um, but on exam, I will do things like scratch my head just while I'm talking to the patient, right? Um, and see, do they mimic that? Um, other things, you know, maybe I will rub my stomach or, um, you know, and are they mimicking those patterns of movement or behavior? Now, here's also a tricky thing is sometimes you'll have kids with autism that have some of these things at baseline, this echopraxia, echolalia, stereotomies. So again, this is when you really have to figure out, is this a change from their baseline? Um, so I had a, a patient who had a little finger thing that she, she had Down syndrome. She'd done this for her whole life, right? So they're like, no, that finger thing, that's always been there. But all those other things, no, this is new in the last however many months. So again, establishing even in our kids that have some of these behaviors or tics at baseline, what was there, what is new or different. Um, mannerisms, so this can be often a change in the way they walk, in their gait, um, tiptoe walking, new toe walking um, is can be related, um, hopping, um, and those of you who have seen that catatonic hop, uh, you will not forget it, but it's a very abnormal movement or gait. Um, I've also had some patients do some very impulsive things. I had a, a, a patient who her mom calls it the cheerleader while she'll just all of a sudden jump up and put her hands straight in the air like a cheerleader. Um, and so are they doing any of those kind of mannerisms that are very odd or different for them? For bidgeration, uh, this is that broken record, that scratched record. So are they repeating words over and over? And, and it's like not, oh, yeah, they repeated that thing back to me. It's like people will say stuff like 400 times. <laughs> and, um, and so really getting that, you know, and sometimes I think too, that's hard in autism to say, oh yeah, they perseverate over things. But sometimes this is really stuck and it can be just one word. It can also be entire phrases. It can also be stuck kind of in the middle of the sentence trying to say, you know, you and I might end up coming out you and can't get on and it taking a lot of time till they can complete the sentence. 
Um, rigidity. So this is, um, as it says, maintaining a rigid posture. So, you know, when you try to move their arms or their leg, um, having uh, some really, it's very difficult to move them. Again, this can be sometimes difficult in a patient who maybe is not understanding what you're asking of them. Uh, negativism, and this is a, a real important one, because a lot of times, <laughs> Kids are presenting to us because they're being oppositional, right? Um, but negativism and catatonia is actually not just that they're trying to make our lives difficult, right? So um, often it's resistance to instructions or if you try to move them or they do the exact opposite of what you tell them them to. So even asking, is there a change or an increase in refusal to do things? So as an example, sometimes kids will maybe be engaging in this repetitive behavior or in the, the family tries to intervene and they say, they push me away, or I try to get them to do this thing and they back up and sit down. And so it seems like, oh my gosh, they're just being oppositional. Do they don't want to do that? But it actually can be a symptom of catatonia. Um, waxy flexibility, uh, this is again kind of a classic thing where people say, oh, you can, with catatonic people that you can move them and they will stay there. Um, but, but really it's kind of almost this passive resistance to when you, you try to move their arm or bend it, it, it feels almost like you're bending of a wax candle. There's that flexibility there. Withdrawal, this is an important one. This can be refusing to eat to drink, to make eye contact. Um, and so all of these things, and a lot of times you notice even in my vignettes that decrease in intake and often weight loss uh, is really important. And sometimes it's not acute, like, oh yeah, they stopped eating you know, two days ago. Sometimes it is very slow. So going back and finding out what their weight was prior and now, um, I can't tell you how many families are like, I didn't realize they've lost like 25 pounds, right? Because it happens often very slowly. Um, and some other questions that I like to ask about that we sometimes find in catatonia, um, do they need help with getting started with a movement? So this reminds probably some people of Parkinson's of having trouble, but for example, trouble making that first step or um, going up and down stairs or crossing thresholds or something about moving to the next thing is very, very difficult. Um, have there, has there been a change in their writing where they're writing with the other hand or their writing has gotten very small? Um, do they get stuck in the middle of movements? And I think that's one that I have coming up. Um, I will see here, I'll go backwards. Um, and the tendency, I may repeat that one, um, but do they get stuck in the middle of movements, right? When they're bringing uh, like a fork to their mouth, do they get stuck halfway? And then able to repeat it maybe sometimes 30 seconds later. So asking about how they're feeding themselves, asking with brushing teeth, a lot of times that brings that up for, for families. Um, impulsivity, um, sometimes this can be uh, just all of a sudden, um, I've had patients just take their clothes off, uh, run down the hallway. And again, this can be present intermittently with some slowness and some other things. So a lot of time, if a kid is agitated in the hospital and does something like that, what happens? They get an antipsychotic right? um, because they're being agitated. So again, thinking is this impulsivity or this bizarre inappropriate behavior or a change from their baseline and is it part of a larger um, catatonia syndrome automatic obedience um this is exaggerated cooperation excuse me with the examiner's request so the way that we often um, in the classic exam um it will say you know stick out your tongue, I'm going to put a pin in it. Um, I'm a child psychiatrist. I'm not going to tell any child I'm going to put a pin in their tongue. <laughs> so another way that you can test for that is sticking your hand out to shake it. And sometimes they will shake it repetitively, repetitively, repetitively and not let go. Um, so these, these two always uh, stump people on um, the... Um, sorry, I'm getting paged in the middle of this. Um, Sometimes some people as hard, I say they're German terms, Mitgehen and uh, Gegenhalten, um, and they are very similar. The angle poise lamp is really just the arm raises um, with very light touch. Again, it's almost that um, automatic obedience, um, and Gegenhalten is um, really that uh, resistance to passive movement when you when you push against.
Um, and the tendency, that's the one that I was describing earlier, um, where you get stuck in the middle of a movement, like bringing the fork to the brush to teeth. The other place I often see ambidextrity is getting up or sitting down. So they'll get like partway up from the couch and they just like kind of be crouched there or vice versa, almost hover over the couch before they can sit down. This is something you might see in the ED or your office. Um, occasionally you'll see a grasp reflex um, for separation. This will be returning to the same topic, um, persisting over and over, getting stuck in loops of behavior or repetitive speech. Again, sometimes, especially with individuals with developmental disorders, people are, you know, you might say, oh, this is just their autism. But again, um, you know, look at it compared to their baseline. And if it's part of that larger syndrome, could it be also be part of, of catatonia? Um, symptoms that can be harder to elicit, again, sometimes um, combativeness, um, trying to figure out what that is related to, especially if there's underlying illness. Is it catatonia? Is it delirium? Is it an, And there's obviously a lot of overlap here, and this is really where developing those clinical skills and honestly just starting to pick up and see a lot of folks with catatonia um, helps with starting to differentiate that. Um, the other big thing you need to look out for, um, and I actually just saw a patient in my office last week that I hospitalized that had catatonia related to an underlying autoimmune illness, and when he came to my office, he was developing autonomic abnormalities, and he had to go to the hospital and um, get some IV steroids, um, but his uh, blood pressure had spiked really, really high. It was like 170 over 110. His heart rate was in uh, the 130s, um, and so obviously very abnormal. So these are folks you're checking on this um, very frequently. Autonomic abnormalities, obviously, increase the risk. Sometimes we see that in the convergence and malignant uh, catatonia. I'm not going to spend really time talking about that much today, um, but that's when you do get the autonomic issues, um, often hyperthermia, a lot of rigidity, and can have organ shutdown, and, and that's one of the instances in which catatonia can be lethal. So again, really um, checking those vitals every time you see these patients and monitoring it is important. Um, so again, Pop quiz here, um, which of the following would represent negativism and catatonia, just to kind of take this point home. Um, so the patient resists limb manipulation. Um, when you um, try to push against their arm, they push back with equal force. Refusal or opposition to complete ADLs. Um, refusal to urinate or defecate on the toilet, but then having an accident right after clenching teeth and refusing to eat when someone attempts to feed them. Also seen it on eye exams, right? Squeezing eyes really shut, um, not wanting to open them. And a lot of times that is um, taken as uh, oh, behavioral, right? Well, that's behavioral. They just didn't want to cooperate. Actually, right, it can be um, uh, all of the above is the answer. It can all be symptoms of negativism and catatonia. So the treatment of, of catatonia syndrome is really, again, um, targeting uh, that neurotransmitter uh, imbalance that we saw, um, that we talked about earlier. The primary treatment is uh, lorazepam that we use. There are other benzodiazepines that can be used. Um, but really choosing GABAergic medications um, that increase GABA. And so this is that paradoxical almost reaction to it, not in the way that we think of paradoxical reactions to lorazepam where people get agitated. But for example, you know, if you gave me two milligrams of lorazepam, I'm going to fall asleep. Um, and often in catatonia, two milligrams of lorazepam, they actually make them perk up more, uh, maybe talk a little bit more, eat. That's kind of our initial trial. But, but know that treating catatonia, because there is thought to be such a deficit in GABA neurotransmission, sometimes they have to use really, really high doses. So you'll see even children, even kids, need doses of like 24 milligrams of lorazepam. I think the highest I ever saw was 32 milligrams of lorazepam. And again, um, and these 
these folks are not having the side effects of lorazepam, including sedation and all of that, right? It's improving the catatonia. So um, because I do treat a lot of catatonia, you can imagine, I think I'm on like the DEA, like, you know, bad position <laughs> list of letters like, did you know that your patient is taking this much lorazepam? I'm like, yes, because I am prescribing it. Um, I Before I moved and left Indiana, I did get catatonia listed um, as an indication for lorazepam. Uh, for Indiana Medicaid. So that was my <laughs> my one thing. After many back and forth uh, with them, they did list that. Um, so that's been helpful. And I think I got it added uh, for, for Ambient as well, Zolpidem. But, um, but that can be some barriers. And sometimes if people are not familiar with catatonia, that worries them because we're saying, um, oh my goodness, uh, you know, this patient isn't talking and they've got their eyes closed and you want us to give them 16 milligrams of Ativan? You know, I talk about freaking out a pediatrician, <laughs> a kid on a hospital floor, but actually this is what's indicated. And if you monitor their vitals and everything, you can see they tolerate it well and, and it improves. Um, there are some other um, options for treatment. I talked about NMDA being overactive, right? So sometimes some anti-NMDA receptor agonists to antagonists to bring the NMDA down. So this is when we're talking about amantadine, um, memantine, some other things. And then electroconvulsive therapy, um, which I know many of you are very familiar with, but I think often is, is under-recognized with what... Um, what an amazing treatment is for catatonia and that if we're not responding to lorazepam or we've not fully responded to lorazepam, moving to ECT is the next step. If you have someone who you're trying, you know, has developed autonomic instability or is acutely ill, they're not eating and drinking, you're going to move to ECT much more quickly. Um, and that's even in kids. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Again, I want to point out that when we're just thinking about treating the catatonia symptoms, several studies have shown that whether you have catatonia from your anti-NMDA encephalitis or your lupus or whatever it is, or you have catatonia from major depression or psychosis, it responds to lorazepam and ECT, which we know the mechanisms of those and the, the, you know, the mechanism of ECT, which again, we don't as a field completely understand, but it's actually the response to the ECT, the brain's response and how the brain increases GABA naturally after a seizure um, that, that is thought to help with ECT. So um, again, I think just fascinating that these treatments can really help the catatonia syndrome. It's important, however, right? Right? If I have lupus and the lupus has caused catatonia, you can you can help my catatonia symptoms. In order for me to really improve and, and stay stable, you also got to treat my lupus, right? And so it's really important that we're identifying um, some the underlying medical or psychiatric diagnoses uh, that are there, and also recognizing that we may need to treat um, some different sequelae that have occurred and, and a lot of supportive care because, you know, you will see individuals that have that amazing, oh my gosh, two milligrams of Ativan, and now they're talking and they're great and, you know, they're able to go home after, you know, a, a trial of doing this for a few days. Um, that's often not the norm in a lot of these cases. And, and I think some of it as a child psychiatrist is, you know, when we have kids presenting as very, very ill, often um, they just have a very severe course of disease, no matter what it is. So sometimes um, these kids are just really sick, right? I mean, if you have your first episode of psychosis when you're 15, um, you know, you're, you're often pretty sick and it's, it's a very severe illness. So a lot of times um, there is required ongoing like ECT maintenance. And, and now we're, we're learning that pulling people off of their benzos too quickly actually often precipitates the, the recurrence of catatonia. So rather than a couple of weeks taper, we're talking months to, to over a year sometimes in some of these patients. So really sometimes thinking that the improvement and the support that they're going to need 
um, from behavioral therapy to nutrition therapies to all of these things can be really um, substantial and long term. Um, again, I want to just point out the special considerations, especially if, you know, I think and at the NDI, when you're getting pediatric patients, these are patients that have caused a whole lot of trouble in outside emergency rooms and hospitals and, and all of that. They've probably been given multiple rounds of Haldol because they tore apart someone's ED, right? I mean, we, we're all familiar with the situation. And I think that just a re reminder that that oftentimes agitation or some of these repetitive behaviors or some of this impulsivity gets treated with antipsychotics and actually then worsen catatonia. And so we always have to have it kind of on our mind and on our brain is, is that one, is this child on a neuroleptic that is making the catatonia worse and has there been a change? And so sometimes asking, you know, with, after they got that medicine, not only do they not improve, did they get worse is important when going back and getting that history. And if you're concerned about catatonia, getting them off of that neuroleptic to see if they improve is really important. Um, obviously in pediatric patients, we have medical legal considerations. So there are limitations on the use of ECT in the pediatric population, um, very variable through states. So, um, for example, in, um, Texas and Colorado, you cannot do ECT in a child under the age of 16. So I did, uh, my child psychiatry fellowship at university of Colorado. Um, we did have some pediatric patients who uh, needed ECT, and actually at Children's Colorado was the very first documented case of um, pediatric anti-NMD encephalitis. Um, can't happen if you're under 16. So one of my patients actually when I was there had to fly to Michigan. <laughs> to get regular ECT um, for a catatonia. So um, some states, like I said, you have to really know your state laws and how that works. This is this is one area where Indiana, um, it's it's a good place to practice um, child psychiatry for, um, for this population. Um, the law is actually silent on pediatric ECT, so it doesn't have rules around it unnecessarily. I mean, it has kind of ECT in the statutes, but it doesn't specify adult versus pediatric. So fortunately, ACAP, which is the Association for Child Psychiatrists, really came up with best practice guidelines that in pediatric patients, they recommend consultation and a recommendation of ECT by two independent child psychiatrists and obviously consent from the parent um, in order to move forward. So, um, you know, Methodist has a very robust uh, ECT service and they actually um, often t take pediatric patients um, even from, from other states um, and Ohio and things like that. And some of that is just the, the availability of ECT in our state. So yay, Indiana, um, for, for, um, for allowing that. Because here's the thing. ECT is safe, right? Um, it is FDA approved in the treatment of catatonia as well as major depressive disorder and children 13 and over. And we all know that there's a lot of ongoing stigma against mental health and ECT. And what it does is it really limits the accessibility of, of a life-saving treatment um, to many pediatric patients across the country. And what I'm about to say sounds a little, a little crude, but it is easier for a parent, often in many states, to authorize that their child has a limb amputation than to authorize that their child gets ECT. Um, and so, you know, lots of uh, options for advocacy uh, for, for all of us and opportunities for that. Um, so really quickly, I know I'm running out of time and I did want to save a little time for some um, questions at the end, but I want to revisit our cases. So the 13-year-old girl um, had some anxiety, had this week change, so medical workup, negative, and, and just very briefly, I know I didn't spend a lot of time on that and happy to chat offline with folks, but, but you know, pretty extensive, really depending on the presentation, but we're talking brain MRI, LP, a lot of um, serum studies, inflammatory markers, and some different things that we're checking, including a UTOX. So she had a big medical workup. It was positive, Utox was positive for marijuana, but that was the only thing. Very concerning exam for catatonia. We admitted her, treated her with lorazepam and improved. Once she was able to talk, she admitted to smoking spice. <laughs> 
Adam Pari, um, um, and then developed catatonia, and that is certainly a known cause of catatonia. Um, and they, we did get the send out Utox back, and it was confirmed um, that she was positive for synthetic marijuana. Um, unfortunately, it was not the last time I worked with this young girl because she came back a month later after smoking spice again and got catatonia again. So I think that is the other thing to really, um, especially when patients have had cat catatonia related to drug use, is that they're obviously susceptible <laughs> to catatonia. We don't have long-term studies, but multiple people that have had catatonia have recurrent catatonia, whatever disorder it's related to. And so really talking um, with them about that, especially if substance use is the issue. Um, so case two, this is our 16-year-old guy. Um, he had a big medical workup, had rapid improvement with lorazepam, but was not sustained. And we'll see that sometimes they get better, but then they start going backwards and you up the dose and they get better and they start going backwards. He ultimately needed ECT treatment. Once he improved and was able to speak, he was floridly psychotic and he was completely mute prior to then. And, you know, and I think there was some concern for maybe was he depressed, but um, after getting to know him in the situation and in light of this and, and going back and then following him out patient, this actually ended up being his first episode psychosis. And he um, later on received a diagnosis of schizophrenia, but actually has done really, really well. Um, so, uh, but he got benzodiazepine you know, he got high doses of lorazepam and ECT as an inpatient, ultimately did have to add an antipsychotic, but um, chose one, um, like olanzapine and clozapine, less likely to worsen um, catatonia and just proceed with caution, knowing that you probably, you need some benzo and some antipsychotic on board. Um, Case three, uh, this was actually a, um, a patient that presented to my outpatient neuropsychiatry clinic um, as an outpatient referral. And, um, you know, when I saw her, she was psychotic, she was catatonic, um, and I was very concerned with her history um, that there was something medical going on. Um, so I sent her to the hospital. Um, we did a further medical workup. Um, she actually, that's supposed to say thyroid. Her TPO antibodies were elevated to over 700. That's really high. <laughs> it's supposed to be like less than 25. Um, and so her diagnosis actually was Hashimoto's uh, thyroiditis. Um, she was treated with steroids. Hashimoto's is very responsive to steroids. She had significant improvement in her symptoms. So that decline, which everyone thought was depression and all that, and the catatonia was actually an underlying autoimmune disorder. Um, so case four, uh, this was our girl that developed really over a period of a few weeks, auditory hallucinations, insomnia, all these issues got much worse on risperidone, actually became mute on risperidone. So we admitted her um, to our unit. She had a very extensive medical workup, which was really negative. She did respond to benzodiazepines, but her, her psychosis um, was persistent despite trials of antipsychotics, we ultimately ended up getting a PET scan which showed evidence of inflammation in the temporal lobes, even though she had had a very normal MRI, very normal LP. Um, we treated her empirically then with steroids and IBIG for suspected autoimmune encephalitis with significant improvement. And she has done extremely well, um, has returned to her previous baseline, but does require ongoing immunotherapies as an outpatient to main stability. This is a child who was inpatient site for months, right? So this was really important. She was not going to get better um, with psychiatric care as usual, right? Um, this was not just going to be non-responsive to um, antipsychotics, right? I mean, obviously challenging, but she needed that push for the medical treatment and really us developing partnerships with our uh, rheumatology friends um, to say, gosh, we need to try this and, and it has, you know, saved her life. Really. Um, and then our last guy um, with autism and uh, medical workup negative, obviously has lots of risk factors, seizure disorder, all of that, had a rapid response to lorazepam, um, you know, was moving, interacting, using sign language, but very physically aggressive, difficult to manage, um, ultimately has responded well. 
to ECT with improved catatonia, aggression, and self-injurious behavior. Um, if you're interested in this, I didn't spend time on it today, but there's um, quite a growing literature, and Lee Wachtel at Kennedy Krieger and Johns Hopkins really writes a lot about this, about um, self-injurious behavior in autism, and sometimes really treatment-resistant self-injurious behavior, she strongly believes, um, is, is actually catatonia and treats it with ECT and has really great results. Um, and so she's, she's written a fair amount about that, so I really encourage you to think about it in some of those really uh, treatment resistant cases as well. Um, so here's a couple of articles um, for some recommended reading. I think these are both great reviews. Um, Aaron Hopman is a friend and again Lee Wachtel um, is uh, at Kennedy Creeker that I mentioned and both of those are great reviews of pediatric catatonia including kind of how to do the workup and such. And then um, just briefly for those of you who don't believe that Kansas could be a beautiful place to live. And in case you want to ever live in Kansas someday, let me close with some beautiful pictures <laughs> of Wichita, Kansas. Um, not to try to hire away from the NDI, but we are hiring here at KU Wichita. So, um, I am available for any questions. I realize I took almost the whole hour in with my technical difficulties, but um, open to questions. Yeah, I'd be curious yes. um, if treatment with lorazepam is just until symptoms remit or what the what the typical course is there. With the lorazepam, how long uh -huh. do you do it? Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is this is really the learning curve because I think traditionally people, you know, you saw the improvement and then they got better and then they would get discharged and often... <laughs> frequently get tapered off, right? Um, as long as they were doing well, and then we'd see recurrence of the catatonia. And I will say that, especially in my neurodevelopmental population, we're often keeping folks on lorazepam for months and months and doing very slow tapers off. And um, Nira Gazadine is a child psychiatrist at the University of Michigan. And um, I've, I've done some work with her and, and she talks about, again, very, very slow tapers in her pediatric patients. Um, and as long as they're not experiencing side effects to the lorazepam, um, it is okay to continue it. Um, and, and, you know, and, and like I said, when people start saying or families say, gosh, after I give them their morning lorazepam, they're taking a nap, I might pull it down a little bit, right? But really in that kind of response, um, I think we feel that pressure to pull them off of it because we've kind of been trained like, ah, benzos, this is bad, you know? And the pharmacist is like, what are you doing? And, you know, you have to do prior off and stuff, but really pushing back and, and, and slowly tapering off of those um, is, is really usually the most successful thing. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering more about diagnosis because uh, I work on the adult units and we don't have families. We don't know their baseline. Uh, and a lot of, there's a, obviously a lot of overlap between just general psychosis and catatonia. And like when I'm seeing behaviors that could be catatonia, the diagnostic criteria that I find are silent on how long those symptoms have to be present for or like this, how severe it has to be. So do you have any guidance yeah. on, on that? Yeah, so again, I think that's one of those things that's really um, evolving. And so catatonia can come on very acutely. It can come on over a course of a couple of days, you know. Um, it can also be present for years. <laughs> and, and there are certainly case reports, and I've taken care of a patient that had pretty severe catatonia and was completely mute for more than three years and responded to benzos and ECT. Um, and so I think if you're suspicious of catatonia and you have no information and the patient isn't doing well and has symptoms, I mean, going back to some of those studies where in, you know, looking at inpatient units where they had adults with, with pretty severe mental illness, sometimes up to 38% of them had catatonia. So, so I think there's sometimes some opportunities in treatment resistant patients, right, to really go back and re-examine is there catatonia? Could we be do something different um, in terms of their treatment? Would they benefit from a trial of lorazepam? I mean, again, I think because of the potential misuse of as a as a, a substance to get high, benzos have kind of fallen out of favor. And again, we were taught like, don't give people benzos, but but benzos actually have a really great role, and we're not using them because someone's a little bit anxious, right? I mean, this is really trying to correct an, an underlying um, neurotransmission issue. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm at the point that if I suspect it, um, I try 
benzos to see. And then also sometimes it prompts me to, I think anytime you see someone that's treatment resistant, like what else am I missing? Like when's the last time that this person had a brain MRI? When's the last time this person had a good medical workup, right? Because a lot of times we get these folks, we get like three pages of records, right? We don't know anything about them. I mean, it happens with pediatric patients too. And so sometimes we have to just go back and say, what would I want to do to work up this patient? I do have access um, to papers. Um, I have several papers um, that I am happy to share about, um, and I can forward those to Justin about um, self-injurious behavior and autism and catatonia. So, um, and the patient that I referenced, actually, that was my patient when I was at Colorado that um, flew back and forth to Michigan, had um, very severe autism, had very severe self-injurious behavior, um, that child had more functional behavioral analyses than any one person should really have in their life. I mean, had been through, had really, really specialized care and had severe, severe head banging and um, responded to ECT. So, and there are multiple case reports about that. So again, I think it is, it is just a, another thing for us to put in our differential when we think about treatment resistance or difficult to treat patients, right, is to, you know, is catatonia playing a role? Justin, I have a question. Great. Uh, yeah, Fred. Uh, Fred Bedwin, I'm the hospital chaplain uh, and certainly feel out of my depth, but I've been listening um, to your responses and, and the presentation. Um, you know, in pastoral care, uh, we kind of work with folks not just spiritually, but kind of the whole person. And one of the things here at NDI, as you know, is our strong focus on trauma and sort of trauma-informed care as a baseline. And in listening to the case studies, I, I wonder if trauma is a cause of catatonia and catatonia is a defense mechanism for the body from trauma for things that are just too much for the brain to handle. So I think trauma absolutely can cause catatonia. It is one of the things. So again, kind of going back to, and, and you know, early in psychodynamic theory, when we didn't understand anything about the brain or any of these, you know, and, and honestly, the, the NMDA encephalitis, we didn't even know about N N NMDA antibodies until 15 years ago. Like that's when that first case was reported. So we've learned so much, but absolutely some of those early theories and that's where like scared stiff and stuff came from. But there's truth to that, right? We know that severe trauma actually can, and that's some of those, you know, when I showed the animal models and, and they've, you know, there is some relation to, um, and I think you're right, some defense mechanism, but it's not the only cause. And so in the past with catatonia, like the patients that I showed, those classic ones, those folks were getting treated with just psychodynamic therapy, right? Assuming that they all had trauma and, and you know, probably a good number of them had encephalitis or some other things. Um, but, but absolutely, it is one of the causes. And in fact, there is a case report, I think it's been a few years ago, of um, a 14-year-old girl who developed catatonia after some severe cyberbullying. So, um, and I think in some of those cases, it's kind of like PTSD. So not everybody who experiences trauma develops PTSD. Not everybody who experiences trauma will develop catatonia. So it's likely some underlying predisposition to develop catatonia. Um, but but you're absolutely right that that we know that it can cause that. And so I think the cool thing about psychiatry and when we learn about these the psychodynamic theories and all of that, it's 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 still really relevant and important because it really teaches us like you know, our understanding of how they meld together and what's actually going on in the brain after experiencing a significant trauma. Um, again, there, there were valid observations. Um, it was just based in psychodynamic theory and it's, it's nice how we can see them to start pair together. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Carlson. Hello, Dr. Fatman. Hi, just wanted to say thank you. This was a fabulous presentation, and I know there's a lot of questions, and um, we love anything you're willing to share with us through Justin. That would be great, but thank you, and hello from Indy. <laughs>
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And Justin, I will, I'll send, um, I'll send the two articles that I talked about. I'll attach those as well as a, a few others that I think are, are relevant and helpful. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great. I'd love to share those out. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys so much. I miss Indiana. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Take care guys. All right. Bye-bye.